Chapter 31 Approaching Danger The dream world was in turmoil. Trig had never seen the sky so disturbed, the river agitated. Even the grass below his feet seemed to have changed color. It was all so... wrong. Tana arrived a few minutes after Trig. She stroked her hair nervously and shivered. Something's wrong, Trig told her. It feels like something happened here, Tana said. For the first time, the two children turned away from the river, searching the landscape for any kind of high ground where they could get a better view. Trig scrambled up a nearby hill and found a tree. He climbed up its branches and took in the surroundings. I see something, Trig called out. There's a storm far off, like a huge thunderstorm. How bad is it? Tenna called from the ground. We don't have a lot of places to shelter down here. Well, the storm clouds are green, Trig said. Like a really dark green. And there's lots of lightning, too. It must mean something bad is coming, Tenna breathed. Trig, will you come down now? I'm scared. Scared I'm going to fall, Trig teased her. Scared of being alone, Tenna confessed. The Resonance Cascade had returned to the starship Hualinga, where Ponico insisted on interrogating Veldenura alone for almost an entire day. Trig, Tenna, and Appia spent their downtime helping the mercenaries repair one of the SeaWiz turrets. It had jammed during their fight with the Hualinga. This gimbal motor fix is going to be temporary, Glossom told the group. Sooner or later, we'll have to take the ship into a starport to have it looked at by a professional. I thought you were an engineer, Tenna said to Glossom. Can't you fix it? I was a combat engineer, Glossom clarified. All I can do is make sure our equipment holds up during the next fight. You want a long-term fix? We gotta get into port. In the chaos of the past few weeks, Trig had largely forgotten that the R4 mercenaries were, in fact, former members of the Sutherian military. Now that he thought about it, all of the mercenaries except for Ponico had seamlessly slid into whatever roles they performed in their old occupation. Tactical Officer Rulan was the most obvious of the crew, owing to the fact that he kept his title. Once the turret was fixed, the crew fanned out to do maintenance on other parts of the ship. Trake and Tenna stayed together, moving to a nearby access hatch that allowed access to the maneuvering thruster fuel lines. Although the cascade was pressurized, Trake and Tenna both donned oxygen masks before setting to work on the argon gas tanks. I've been thinking, Tenna said. Ponico said one of the keystone shards is on Tritonus, the Olenvar homeworld. Yep, I remember, Trig said. Trig, have you ever been on a planet before? I haven't. Both children froze. Trig instantly understood what Tenna was trying to say. Tritonus was not a moon like Lightwater or Edelton or Sutheria, but a full-sized planet, and that meant... Gravity, Trig groaned. So far, Trig and Tenna had only experienced the equivalent of 1G a total of three times, all of them aboard the Resonance Cascade when it was under heavy thrust. We won't be able to walk on Tritonus, Tenna said. We won't even be able to stand upright. Maybe... Maybe we can prepare, Trig mused, starting to think as hard as he could. Ponico and Veldenura were still alone together on the Hualinga, so Trig and Tenna decided to track down the only two Olenbar they knew, Appia and Glossom. Unfortunately, they were not as helpful as Trig hoped. Sorry, kid. I was born on Sutheria, Glossom said. My mom was Kund, and my dad was Olenbar. His family came to Sutheria during the uplift. Same as Glossom. Appia told Tenna, I'm a moon kid. Never set foot on a planet before, but I have stood in 1G before. Never walked, though. Wait, 
You've stood in 1G? Trick gasped. Tell us. To his surprise, Appiah's face darkened. A purple tinge appeared on her blue cheeks, and she looked down, visibly uncomfortable. Appiah had to sit before she continued. Last year, Appiah whispered, right after I joined the SLA, the secret police came into our hospital and took a bunch of us. Me included, there were like twenty of us. They said they were investigating something. Never found out what. Asked us all about the people we knew and the places we've been. After a while, they made us get on their starship, and they flew us into orbit. Then... Then... Appiah's voice cracked, and she stopped talking. Trig and Tenna put their hands on her shoulder. They wanted her to continue, but were frightened of what she might say. A voice spoke over their heads. Gravity torture. It was Kara. She looked down at the children with sorrowful eyes. I've seen it, Trigg's mother continued, during my time on the prison ship. The force of gravity itself is a torture instrument that never fails. Young girl, how long did they have you up on hooks for? Don't know, Abia confessed. My dad says it was less than a day. Felt longer. Secret police guys only talked to me while I was up there. And when they released us, only three of the others went home with me. Secret police kept everyone else. You don't know how lucky you were to be released, Kara said. Someone up there must like you. Kara pointed upwards, invoking the idea of divine intervention. Appiah looked at Trigg. So, uh, yeah, she said. I know what it feels like to stand in 1G. If you were born on a moon, you're not going to take it well. As the afternoon wore on, everyone ran out of work to do. There was nothing left but to wait for Ponico to finish with Veldonura. Tenna stepped into the CIC and used one of the computers to tune into the local interlink. Trigg watched over her shoulder. So, this is the MSI interlink, Trigg commented as Tenna flipped from one data feed to the next. Looks like it's nothing but ads. It's like 90% ads, Tenna admitted. What kind of entertainment do you watch then? Trigg said. Just documentaries? Pretty much, Tenna replied. MSI interlink is really different compared to what I saw in Sutheria. You guys have... So much ad-free programming. I don't know how your government could afford to buy anything. Tenna paused when she found a link that was not advertising something. It was a televised ceremony taking place on Tritonus, the Oldenbar homeworld. A member of the MSI board of directors was visiting a stock exchange and doing interviews with the businessmen who worked there. Trigg absentmindedly watched as the names of these people appeared on the bottom of the screen, written in the Oldenbar language. He focused his gaze on these names, trying to interpret them, and suddenly wishing he paid more attention during Oldenbar class at school. It was in this moment that something interesting happened. An Oldenbar name appeared at the bottom of the screen, identifying a man the MSI board member was speaking to. By the time Trigg read and understood the word, both the man and his name had vanished from the screen. But the man's name stuck with Trigg. Hey, Tenna, didn't Ponico say that one of the keystone shards was being held by a guy named Avitus? Yeah, Tenna nodded. Avitus, I've heard of him before. Oldenbar used to run a megachurch devoted to the old Oldenbar pantheon before the Nagyari Wars joined the Horde and convinced his whole following to do the same. Something about psionic destiny, I think. Why do you ask? Because I just saw him on the screen. Tenna grabbed at the controls, desperate to rewind the video and take a screenshot of the man Trigg pointed out. At the same moment, Tactical Officer Rulon was trying to solve a mystery in the cockpit. 
He watched the sensors display with a furrowed brow as three Nagyari warships hyperspaced into the system and began flying toward the Resonance, Cascade, and Hualinga. They were far away. It would take a day and a half for the Nagyari vessels to intercept the Cascade if they maintained their current speed. But something was wrong. Cantor, this is Rulan. Rulan spoke into the radio. I've got three Nagyari warships on my scope, approaching at stellar transit speed. All three of them seem to be broadcasting MSI recognition signals. Can you get an ID on any of them? Cantor asked. Rulan opened the digital recognition manual. This was a database containing the identifying marks and signals of starships registered to both MSI and the Sutherian Empire. Some starships were so unique in their design that solely their radar signature or the chemical composition of their engine plume could identify them. Rulan fed the sensor data into the computer and waited for a few moments. He was disappointed to learn that of the three warships, two of them could not be identified. However, the computer quickly returned a result for the third vessel. Vessel ID, Super Capital Class Warship, Kaldorix. Radar cross-section, 90% match. Rulan swore, and then he punched the intercom button. Alert! Malum Ralpakin's old flagship just entered the system and is heading this way! Fuck! Cantor yelled. Ponico, get your ass back on board! We've got to run! Ponico's reply was short and curt. Boring conversation, anyway. As the Resonance Cascade powered up its engines and prepared to flee, there was a short burst of activity on the neighboring Hualinga. An airlock door suddenly slid open, venting its atmosphere into space, along with a body. Veldanura drifted slowly away from his ship, and as he vanished into the darkness of the infinite void, a final, wicked smile was etched onto his face.